My name is Dr. Terry Young. I'm the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Melanie Schmidt, who will be our key speaker today at this Saving Sight session. Dr. Schmidt joined the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in 2014 as an assistant professor. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Genetics at UW-Madison in 2003. She remained here for her um, Doctor of Medicine, which was obtained in 2009. Following her MD, Dr. Schmidt traveled to Royal Oak, Michigan for her transitional year internship at the Beaumont Eye Institute within the William Beaumont Hospital. She remained there for her ophthalmology residency, which she finished in 2013. In 2014, Dr. Schmidt completed her fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the Cole Eye Institute, Cleveland Eye Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Schmidt has developed a very active practice in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus medical and surgical patient care. In addition to teaching medical students, ophthalmology residents, and pediatric ophthalmology fellows. Her expertise in clinical research focus foci lie within inherited retinal degenerations. Since 2014, Dr. Schmidt has participated in 31 clinical trials, two as a principal investigator and 29 as a co-investigator. She's published six refereed articles and uh, provided 48 clinical presentations. Dr. Schmidt currently serves as co-director of ophthalmic genetics in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, director of the UW Health Pediatric Inherited Retinal Disease Clinic at University Station, and the director of Retinopathy Prematurity Services. Furthermore, Dr. Schmidt is the resident director of pediatric ophthalmology, chair of our patient-centered care committee, and a member of the Electroretinography Committee and Clinical Working Group. She's also the newly named John W. Doolittle and Helen Doolittle Pediatric Ophthalmology Professor. Dr. Schmidt, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Young, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I just wanna say it's an honor to be able to uh, speak at this session. Um, the Saving Sight session, and um, to be able to present to such a unique audience from all aspects, including my colleagues and patients in the community. So tonight I'll be, I'll be talking about um, when gene therapy meets reality. And this has been, in the world of ophthalmology, this has been quite um, uh, interesting and evolving area of medicine, especially over the last five to 10 years. Um, so I, I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of background about what the retina means and what vi you know, vision in the eye means and proceed to talk about and focus on um, some retinal, what we call retinal degenerations, and I'll go on to define that. And then focus on one gene therapy uh, clinical trial in particular, um, and also be able to feature one of my patients that's underwent gene therapy in addition to um, their family. So when we look at vision and we talk about vision, there's many important components. And so this slide that I have here, it, it looks very basic, but it's very complex. And I wanted just to give a little bit of background to the audience, because I know we all come from varying levels of um, knowledge. But when I talk about the retina, what I'm talking about is the tissue um, in what we call the, the back of the eye or the posterior part of the eye that um, processes images. Um, and from the, ret from the retina, that tissue, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, the images are sent to the optic nerve, which goes to the brain. And in the brain, it's um, processed by various pathways and centers um, and, and ultimately ends in what we call the visual cortex at the back of the brain. Now, focusing on the retina, um, we as ophthalmologists, when we, we come into a room with our, our gadgets and our lights, I'm sure a lot of you have been wondering what, what exactly we're looking at when we're, we're shining that bright light at your eye. Um, but that is the retina a lot of times. Um, and this is sometimes what the view looks like when we're looking in at the retina. And this is, the retina is a very light sensitive tissue. 
It's very rich in blood supply um, and it requires a lot of oxygen, oxygen, which is often why it's effective in, in many uh, diseases of the body that don't just affect the retina, but other areas of the body. Um, and like I said, it's really important in vision. So this orangish, uh, reddish tissue is a partial view of the retina when we're looking in through the pupil. And this is what we call the circular um, uh, object right there. There's the optic nerve. And then these are blood vessels um, that go in and out of the optic nerve. So again, taking a little bit more focused look at the retina, when we're talking about the retina, like I said, it, it, it's quite complex and it's made up of various layers. And the layer that I wanna focus a little bit more on um, on this slide is the layer that we call the photoreceptors. This is a layer that's in what we call the um, more the outer retina. And in, as you can see, these are different layers of the inner retina. And there are two populations of photoreceptors that um, are important to know about. They include what we call the rod cells and the cone cells. And when we're talking about the rod, um, cells, we're talking about those cells, um, those photoreceptors that are extremely sensitive to light. Uh, and they're important in more dim light settings, so such as night vision. In addition, they play a, a higher or more important role in your peripheral vision. When we mention cones, what we are often referring to are those cells that are more play more of a role in um, what we call our color vision or color sensitivity and brighter light um, images. Those uh, cones tend to be more densely populated in what we refer to as the center of the retina or the macula. I wanted to step back and um, focus on the term or terminology that I'll be throwing around throughout this, this talk or this session. Um, and this term is called inherited retinal degeneration. And sometimes it's, it goes by various other names such as inherited retinal diseases. Um, but the definition of um, an inherited retinal degeneration, which you see on the slide um, below, is that type of um, disease that has, that type of retinal disease that tends to be de degenerative or tends to in general be progressive, though not always, that has genetic factors that play a significant role. Um, and as I'll talk about in some other slides, there are multiple retinal degenerations. Sometimes we refer to this term in addition to um, in inherited retinal degenerations, we abbreviate by IRD or retinal dystrophy. This is a great slide. I always like to look at this because I think it's a great um, visualization of how far we've come in the field of um, inherited retinal degenerations. When you look back to the early 90s, for example, there were very few genes that were mapped or identified, um, you know, only a few dozen. And as you can see over the course of several decades and flash forward to um, 2019, there are over 300 um, genes that cause inherited retinal degenerations that have been mapped. And so there's been a huge explosion in the world of genetics, particularly in the world that um, you know, applies to um, the retina. So uh, to give a little bit of more background about what I do, um, I run a specialty clinic um, here at the University of Wisconsin in the Department of Ophthalmology. And I started my clinic in 2014 um, when I came here out of fellowship. And I've modeled my clinic out of you know, a few other clinics um, like mine throughout the country. Though um, we, we are quite unique and lucky, um, there aren't many like this, like I said, in the country. Um, and I have this clinic one um, Friday a month, and I, per, I you know, mainly see at this point pediatric patients and my adult, adult counterpart, Dr. Kim Stepien, who's adult medical retina, sees primarily adult um, IRD patients. Um, I see it one full day, like I said, at University Station. Um, and then I also travel to an area of the state called Lafarge, Wisconsin, a few hours northwest of Madison to do a genetic eye disease clinic, um, primarily in the Amish and Mennonite population there. What makes this clinic so unique is 
the resources we have and the team we have. Um, you know, I obviously see the patients and I have experience in retinal dystrophies, but um, I would say the gold mine is, is really the team. So I have uh, two genetic counselors that specialize in um, eye genetics that work with me. Um, I have a, I'm lucky to have a study coordinator that's in clinic. And then I have um, an electrophysiology team and a photography team that are just phenomenal with children. Um, and we have the opportunity and time to really spend um, hours with our patients and do a very thorough exam, get a thorough history, and really get to the, the, the source or the cause of what may be going on. Um, and that's often what what a lot of patients come in to see me is they often have, um, are undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. And so this, this is where um, I think everything really comes together. In addition to seeing them, you know, on their first appointment, I typically follow my patients um, long-term and that may be any, you know, as frequent as month, you know, so every several months to six months or once a year. We also talk about um, clinical trials and um, give a lot of education for our patients and either their clinical trials that are here at UW, which I'll talk a little bit later, or others that are available nationally. So we've come a long way, I would say, since we started what's called our ocular, inherited ocular disease registry back in 2017 that Dr. Um, Steppi and I started. Um, we've been able to enroll about 550 patients in this um, genetic eye disease registry with about a, a fourth of those being children and about three fourths being adults, the majority of which have undergone genetic testing um, through a wonderful partnership we have with a foundation um, fighting blindness that's allowed us um, pretty easily to be able to test our, our patients. When I'm talking about um, the various inherited retinal degenerations, like I mentioned, there are you know, about a 300 different genes identified, but in any given clinic, there is a propensity for certain diseases. Um, the most common ones that we tend to see are um, retinitis pigmentosa, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, and other diseases such as carotoremia. But the one that I want to focus on today, um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail um, shortly, is a disease called labor congenital amaurosis. So this um, is a relatively rare disease. Um, its incidence is only about two uh, to three per 100,000 births. Um, but unfortunately, is it's the most severe inherited retinal degeneration that we see, and it's the most common cause of congenital retinal blindness. Um, there's a lot of variability in terms of the way that patients present, and there's some um, quite a bit of variability in terms of the genes that causes this uh, condition. To date, there's about 26 um, retinal um, genes that have been isolated that cause this condition. Um, and there's about 30 to 50% of patients that don't end up getting um, a known genetic cause, though they may have the clinical diagnosis of what we call LCA. Most of these conditions are inherited in what we call an autosomal recessive fa fashion, meaning they inherit one of the changed or defective genes from mom and one from dad, um, but it takes two to come together in order to have the disease. So that, that's what autosomal recessive in, in a very brief uh, description means. And most tend to affect, affect the layer of the retina of the photoreceptors, um, which I mentioned before, the rod and the, um, the cone cells. The gene that I wanted to focus on um, is in this table, and I'll come back to this later, is the RPE65 gene. So that's one of those 26 retinal genes, and that's one of the causes of autosomal recessive LCA. Like I, I talked about earlier on, um, there can be some variability in the way that um, LCA patients present, but the most common early um, symptom is what we call nystagmus. And what that is, is it's an abnormal, more erratic uh, jiggling of the eyes. And usually that's present within the first few months of life. And later on, individuals may have what we call light sensitivity, or they may do some rubbing or poking of the eyes as well. 
When we talk about the diagnosis of LCA, it can at times be quite difficult to diagnose. And one of the barriers that we run into is at the top, um, I think you recognize this photo top right hand corner, the photo from earlier, that is what we see um, of the appearance of a normal retina. Um, and that's oftentimes early on in the disease when we see a young baby or a young child with labor congenital amaurosis and we look in, oftentimes the retina can look normal um, or at least the, the looks that we get of it can look normal. And so that's what partially why it can be so diff difficult diagnose, to diagnose. Below this normal in the right hand, uh, normal photo in the right hand corner, you see another quite different photo of the, the retina in the lower um, right hand corner. And as you can see, there's all these different pig, what we call pigmentary changes in the retina, where you get these clumping, these black clumping of pigment that we refer to as bone spicules. And this is what we may see later in the disease or more classic, um, what, we, what I'll talk about later is retinitis pigmentosa. So that's a more obvious picture, but oftentimes we're dealing with the above picture where it's not as obvious. One of the things that we really take advantage of at our program here is our electrophysiology uh, program or um, using a device, what we call the electroretinogram. And I always equate this to when patients have, for example, an echocardiogram and they're looking at the electrical, electrical current through the heart or an EEG and they're looking at um, electrical current to the brain. This is very similar to that, but it's looking at the electro, le electro current through the, um, the retina. And where this becomes very valuable is in our young patients that come in and they may have what we think is a normal retina, but we do an, what's called an ERG or an electroretinogram on them, which we are, we are able to do when most of our patients awake, meaning we don't have to take them to an operating room and put them asleep. Um, we see um, pretty severe abnormalities or changes on that ERG, where the ERG normally has waveforms, like you'll see in this next picture, um, but those waveforms are instead flattened and a straight line. So this leads me into um, talking a little bit about um, a patient whose family I have here tonight, and they'll be speaking a little bit later. Um, but I was able to meet this um, wonderful a little girl at the age of one year old, and she came to me, um, and she had had a history of nystagmus or jiggling eyes that started at about two weeks of life. And when you looked in at her retina, this this retinal photo is taken um, with what we call a ret cam, and this was I think even prior to me seeing her, um, and it was done under general anesthesia, so you get a lot better view of what we normally would see, but. Oftentimes, like I said, it looks it can look pretty normal early on. But in her, you can see um, already there's some mild changes in the pigmentation where there's some areas of lighter pigmentation in her retina where it's not quite as red or quite as orange. Um, and she was also found to have what we call high myopia or high nearsightedness. So high nearsightedness also can be a red flag sometimes when there's an early onset in you know, early childhood or infancy of an underlying retinal condition. Um, so that was another red flag. And then we did what's called, like I said, the ERG on her. And instead of having a nice um, several waveforms, like you can see in this relatively normal looking ERG with what we call a downward reflection of the A wave and an upward reflection of a B wave, her um, ERG was relatively flat. There might have been a very small B wave, but overall very, very flat, which is more typical of a, an LCA-like picture. So I'm going to skip over, you know, a lot of details, um, but what we ended up doing based on the clinical findings was genetic testing, um, and we were, we found that uh, she had two changes um, in her genes, um, in um, the gene uh, called RPE65. And um, we found that one was in, you know, uh, passed down from mom and one was passed down from dad. And like I said, this is an autosomal recessive condition. So it requires having um, two defective copies of this gene. And so everything, you know, together was consistent with uh, LCA uh, caused by RP65 and her. 
I'll come back to a little bit more details and, and follow up with her. But what I wanted to focus on now for a few minutes was the RPE 65 gene therapy. Um, this was a huge breakthrough in the world of uh, inherited retinal degenerations. And um, it was approved in December of 2017 by the FDA. And this gene therapy is officially called Luxturna. And it was approved for patients that have two defective copies of RP65 that cause LCA and approved for children that are um, over the age of one or equal to the age of one. And I wanted to go into a little bit of details about the paper and the clinical trial, the phase three clinical trial that occurred and why they decided or why the FDA decided to approve this therapy. The phase three clinical trial looked at how effective and how safe gene replacement was for this condition. And it took place at two sites, one nearby in Iowa and one um, at the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. And it was randomized, meaning there was a control group that uh, didn't receive the gene, th gene therapy and they didn't know whether they received it or not. And another group that received the gene therapy. And again, they didn't know what if they actually re received the therapy or not. And they, they included patients as young as three and they had to have other certain criteria that had to be met, including vision and in terms of how much sufficient um, viable retina was, uh, retina cells were, were there. But two important, uh, or one important thing that I wanted to uh, talk about, because this was relatively a novel um, test, was um, this multi-luminous mobility test. Um, and they had to be unable to pass at its lowest level. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that test. Overall, they were able to recruit 29 participants, 20 received a therapy and nine were controlled. So they did not receive the therapy, at least initially. This uh, mobility course was uh, a navigational course that had borders and it had a path and it was a marked path with obstacles. And the um, individuals had to do the navigational um, um, pathway at different, what we call illuminations. So they did it at um, low levels and then they did it at higher levels. And it varied from what they called the luck score of zero to six. And it was a great way to test because it allowed them to incorporate not just your central visual acuity, but also visual your visual field or your peripheral vision. And then how patients or um, people would do in different um, levels of light and whether or not light sensitivity would affect their ability to um, navigate. Another great part of the study was they looked at um, what was called full, full field light sensitivity threshold. So this was looking at the lowest level of light that was perceived over a patient's entire visual field. And where, why this was important was because a lot of times patients that have nystagmus, when we try to test their vision by conventional measures, their, their vision often measures lower than it is in the real world because of the way in which we test their vision. So this helped to get a useful range um, over a wide or useful um, data over a wide range of visual impairment. Um, just some basic information about how the study was done. What they did is they took a viral vector that contained a normal copy of the gene or normal copy of the RP um, E65. And then it was injected in a surgery in an operating room um, subretinally. And it was done in one eye. And then, um, a, you know, a period of about a week to three weeks later, it was done in a second eye. And then the control group was eligible to receive the um, therapy at um, one year. So when they looked at the results, um, what they found is when you're looking at the top um, chart and the bottom chart, the top chart looks at how um, patients did with that mobility test. And the bottom chart is, is how patients did with the full field uh, sensitivity test. And when you're looking at the, the top chart, you have the um, patients that received the therapy and then you have the control below it. And what they were able to show was that at one, um, at, the, at day 30, there was improvement in that mobility test in the intervention group. 
compared to the control group. And that remains so at one year after receiving the therapy. And that was true as well in that, uh, that full field sensitivity test that they saw improvement, rapid improvement at 30 days. And that remained there at one year in the intervention group com compared to the control group. One of the things that they weren't necessarily expecting with this study wasn't a primary outcome, but they looked at it as well was um, the best corrected central visual acuity. And what they found was that there was improvement of about eight letters in the intervention group versus the control group. And as that was, um, there was some um, maintaining of that at one year as well. So the take home message from this study was that there was improvement in navigational ability, light sensitivity, and visual fields. In addition, um, it was evident within the first 30 days and it remained so at one year. And they also saw, saw some improvement in actual visual acuity as well. So after just giving you some background information about the gene therapy, um, the, the patient that we have here tonight, um, one honor, to undergo gene therapy, um, you know, about 10, 11 months after it was approved in um, November of 2018 in both eyes and show, did show some improvement. Um, and I'm going to have them share their experience in a little bit. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to wrap up my part of the session with talking about some of the clinical trials we have here at UW-Madison that apply to the retina and inherited retinal degenerations. So the first disease I wanted to talk about briefly was X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. And like I said, in our clinic, retinitis pigmentosa is the most common disease we see overall. Um, and it affects the, what we call the rod photoreceptors, which are the photoreceptors that really are important for nighttime vision or um, um, what we call uh, when someone has reduction of nighttime vision, nyctalopia, and also important for peripheral vision. One of the genes I'd like to talk about that accounts for about 70% of X-linked RP is the RPGR gene. Um, this gene, in addition um, to causing symptoms in males, even though it's what we call X-linked, and we traditionally think of X-linked as being a disease that primarily affects males, um, because males have one X chromosome versus females have two X chromosomes, um, we find in our female carriers, they actually can have symptoms and it can be anywhere from mild symptoms to full-blown severe retinitis pigmentosa versus males tend to be overall severely affected. So um, I just wanted to have, to have you take a look at one of uh, our patients with RP60 or um, with um, our RP um, or RPGR um, here. And you can see some of those changes that I mentioned earlier, those bone spicules that you see in classic, classic retinitis pigmentosa in this larger photo versus this smaller photo right here is, is of a relatively normal retina. You can also see there are some mild pigmentary changes um, where there's um, more visibility of what we call the layer below the retina, we call the choroid. So you can see those choroidal vessels. So you see some loss of, of pigmentation or atrophy there. And then again, here is a, a photo, a wide field photo of um, what we call um, fundus autofluorescence. And this is a form of technology that um, highlights um, a substance that we call lipofusion. That is a byproduct of cell death or cell turnover. And what it does is it can highlight areas of increased disease activity. So down here in the right-hand corner, you see a more normal, autofluorescence. And here in our patients, you can see this ring of increased autofluorescence or um, increased um, color, and that represents um, increased disease or increased cell turnover. So the study that we have here at UW is Zolaris, and it's sponsored by Nightstar, and it's an observational study of X-linked retinitis pigmentosa um, in patients that have a defect in the RPGR gene. And we're one of the 20 to 25 centers globally. And it's a two year study period. 
And what it is, is just looking at the nat natural history of the disease. There's not any intervention with gene therapy or treatment, but understanding more about how the gene, uh, disease changes and evolves, particularly looking at visual acuity. The next uh, disease I'd like to talk about um, in which we're doing a clinical trial here at UW is choroideremia. And this is another X-linked condition that causes disease, not just of the retina, but of the layer that I mentioned below the retina, which is called the choroid. And this is a mutation in what we call the CHM gene. And again, primarily affects males, but we do see women um, being affected as well, though typically less severe. And when, when we look in a textbook or we look online, one of the classic uh, appearances of choroideremia is um, that you'll see online is this photo on the left. The photo on the right, again, is what is typically a normal appearing retina. And what you can notice is there's a very, uh, right away, a strikingly white appearance. And that's because not only is there loss of retina, but there's loss of the underlying choroid, which results in this whitish, whitish appearance. You can see here, there's a very little, um, late in the disease, very little um, retina um, left. Um, so this is what we see late in the disease. What can make this is, uh, condition a little bit higher to, to harder to diagnose is early on in the disease, it tends to look more like something like this. And this is um, one of my patients who presented with some slightly reduced vision. So not very reduced. We're talking about 20, 25 to 20, 30 range. But what you can see is this quite dramatic pigmentary changes. And again, as you can see, that looks quite different than the photo that I'll, I'll refer to in the previous slide. Um, it has this, what we call almost like a salt and pepper-like appearance. Um, and this is more typical of early choroideremia. Um, other findings that you can see, and this is another um, type of imaging that I'm gonna talk briefly about, it's called optical coherence tomography. And it's like taking an ultrasound cross section through the retina and looking at the different layers. So I like to always equate it to when you, you look at a, a slice of cake or pie and you, you, take a, you take a cut through it and you're looking at the different layers. So these are the, the layers of the retina. Um, and so what you see with, for example, choroideremia, you see that there's relatively normal retina in the, what we call the fovea or the macula, which is really important for central vision, which is why our patient has such good central vision, but you start to see some disruption of this, what's called the photoreceptor layer. So those rods and those cones um, near the central vision. So you lose in these patients more um, peripheral vision first before you see loss of central vision. So in this uh, solstice clinical trial, which is the coronary uh, clinical trial sponsored by Nightstar, it's again um, um, another uh, gene therapy clinical trial, or it's, it's sorry, it's a long-term follow-up, uh, five-year follow-up of those that were previously enrolled in what's called the STAR study that's ended, which was a phase three um, gene therapy clinical trial for choroideremia. Again, they used um, a viral vector in that study. One of the last diseases I wanna talk about before I, I wrap up is achromatopsia. And this is a disease that tends to affect primarily the cones in the eye and um, results in color vision issues, nystagmus and, and decreased vision. Two of the genes I wanna focus on today are the CNGB3 and um, A3 genes that cause most of achromatopsia. Um, the B, this is a patient that has um, B3, and a lot of times the, the changes are very subtle. Um, oftentimes, just mild pigmentary changes in the center of the retina, but it can be picked up more easily on that autofluorescent imaging that I mentioned earlier, where you have this increased um, autofluorescence right in the center of the retina or the macula. Again, there can be very subtle changes on that OCT. Down here is a normal looking OCT. And in achromatopsia, you tend to have involvement right in the fovea, fovea or under the fovea, what we call subfoveally, in the layers of the retina that include those photoreceptors. You start to see some smudging or blurring of that. Um, in the uh, two, um, trials we are participating in here at UW, the first one is for CNGB3, 
And this is a um, phase one, two clinical trial um, where they're doing gene therapy and they're looking at the safety and um, efficacy of, um, of the gene therapy. And they're trying to enroll 28 patients and following those patients for five um, years. And this is a global multi-center uh, study. What they're looking at is um, visual changes, any um, side effects. Um, it's not randomized. Um, and again, just like the RP65 study, they're injecting um, it subretinally in one eye. Patients are, um, can be as young as six years of age for this study to be able to enroll. Similarly, um, CNGA3, as you can see, again, mild changes on the color photo of the retina, but what you see, and this is poor quality, but what you see is increased intensity on autofluorescence, um, picking up that change in achromatopsia. And that's pretty typical when we see these patients early, early on. Um, and again, you can see that there's more changes in this. This is a normal OCT again, and this is our patient's OCT. And you can see there's more changes in the outer retina, um, more significantly in the fovea and around the foveal region. So again, like the CNGB3 um, clinical trial, this is very similar to that, except it's looking at the CNGA3 gene. And again, it's a, a viral gene therapy trial. They're looking to enroll 24 patients and following them for five um, years as well. This is the last uh, disease I wanna end on, condition I wanna end on. And um, this is um, eyes, which is, um, a gene that's in defective in certain types of retinitis pigmentosa. Um, it's an autosomal recessive form of retinitis pigmentosa, and it's responsible for about 5 to 16% of those um, conditions. So these conditions um, are more typical in um, Asia. It's a higher percentage in the Asian population. But this is an example of uh, one of our patients that has this condition. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, pigmentary changes in the retina. And again, there's a finding that we call where the optic nerve doesn't look quite as pink. It's more um, what we call waxy or white. And the blood vessels tend to be more narrow or um, attenuated. This is the patient with eyes. And as you can see, um, normal OCT below. Above, you can see much more dramatic um, changes compared to, for example, our achromatopsia patient or even our chorderemia patient. And you can see there's changes in many layers of the outer retina, um, some preservation um, in the fovea, but a lot of changes and loss around the area of the fovea. So this is the last study I'll be talking about, but this again is a natural history study. So not intervention, no gene therapy, but looking at those patients that have uh, um, eyes related retinal degeneration and following those patients over the course of four years to see how their vision changes, for example. Um, and all those patients um, need to be adult, adults. So those are some references that I referred to throughout the paper. And um, I really wanted to thank all everyone um, for being here tonight. And before we go, we have the most, I would say the most important part of the night. Um, and it's an honor to be able to introduce um, one of my families that I've been seeing um, their little girl, like I said, since she was one year old. Um, and the little girl that I referred to um, earlier with LCA. So I have um, mom and dad both here tonight and um, they are the Sovi family. And I don't know if McKinley is gonna make an appearance, but I know mom, Julie is here for sure. And I believe- Hi. Dad, hi, Julie. And I know, I think dad is here as well. Correct, yeah, I see dad. So yeah. what I wanted to do is introduce them and I wanted to have them start off and just talk about, before I open it up to questions, talk about their early experiences with their daughter and her vision um, and what they saw from their perspective and maybe what, what they were, are able to convey from her perspective. Sure, I'm sorry, we're separated right now. Thank goodness for virtual, um, stuff because uh, we have a quarantine situation going on. Um, but it was really interesting to listen to um, Dr. Schmidt's kind of clinical explanation of our experience. So I'll kind of try to follow a similar timeline and, you know, from our perspective. So um, the nystagmus and not tracking were 
the first two things that we noticed after our daughter was born that um, she was our second child and our, our first child um, does not have LCA. So, um, you know, those were just kind of little things we noticed. And from the pediatrician, it was just kind of monitor. Um, you know, then a few months later, re referred to um, the pediatric ophthalmologist. And as Dr. Schmidt mentioned on just a normal eye exam, um, the retina can appear to be normal. So um, after that is when we were actually, we are in the M Milwaukee area, but we were sent to Dr. Schmidt's clinic in Madison to get the ERG because locally that um, was not available for us. Um, so it was uh, after the ERG that um, we were kind of able to hone in on what kind of genetic testing should be done for McKinley. Um, so that was kind of our next hurdle because our insurance, there, there was no treatment at the time. So our insurance didn't want to cover gene or uh, genetic testing. They kind of um, just sort of said, well, you know, a diagnosis isn't going to change anything. So with the help of Dr. Schmidt, we were able to find um, some trials that were providing genetic testing. Um, so it was through that avenue that we got McKinley's diagnosis of LCA, specifically the RPE 65G mutation. And I had already been aware at the time that there were some clinical trials going on, but I didn't know um, a whole lot of information. I didn't wanna get ahead of myself. So once we got that, diagnosis at about a year and a half and found out that that was the trial that was for they were furthest along in it was um it was really cool it was very exciting um we kind of dove right into all the research we could do on that and we um uh talked to some doctors at um the university of iowa where um some of the um trials had taken place and the doctor that we chose specifically um treated the most amount of pediatric patients in that trial. So we felt really confident that we found the right guy. Um, it was nerve wracking for us because we knew going into it that our daughter was going to be the youngest patient to ever be treated. Um, it was approved for children one and over, but at the time they were only doing it on kids three and up. And she um, had the treatment done uh, like a month after her third birthday. So, um, you know, it was kind of weighing the pros and cons. They say it's better to intervene as young as possible, yet there's not as much data on these patients. So, um, you know, we made the decision that we thought was going to give her the best outcome. And um, it, 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 we were so happy with the improvement. Um, her visual acuity improved a lot, which was not, um, something that they, you know, promised with this treatment, you know, it was kind of more about um, just stabilizing that decline in vision, which um, we have noticed so far that, you know, her vision seems to be stable. Um, it decreased her nystagmus. Um, it reduced the services that she required in school. We were able to um, take braille and orientation and mobility off of her IEP, which was, you know, a big, a big, um, just kind of uh, celebration for us, you know, it meant um, not more independence, but I guess an easier pathway to independence for her. Um, as far as negatives with the gene therapy, um, you know, you all, there's risks with any therapy or any surgery or anything like that. And she has developed a cataract in one of her eyes and it has um, decreased the vision in that eye a bit. Um, but, you know, we can, that is something that we can and will intervene um, when the time is right for her. But so far, you know, we are so happy with the treatment that we've received from Dr. Schmidt, the treatment that we um, have received from the left sterna surgery and you know, it's, it's been great for our family and I hope that gene therapy continues to evolve and that it becomes available for more and more patients like McKinley. Parker, do you have anything to add? Oh, I think you nailed it. <laughs>
Yeah, I really, I, I really, you know, appreciate your perspective. It's so unique coming from a clinician. We have, you know, a much different perspective and it's nice to hear that. And I like that you brought up the part about the hurdle for genetic testing, because I really breezed past that with a quick slide as if it, I snapped my finger and it happened. When in reality, that, that is a huge hurdle um, for most people. Um, it's becoming a little bit easier now that we have an uh, FDA approved gene therapy, because now the, it's not as easy for the insurance companies to say, well, if we know the diagnosis down to the gene, it's not going to make a difference. Well, now we know it may make a difference. So um, I think that's really changed the way we view how we test patients and how insurance companies um, cover testing. Yeah. So I don't want to take too much time because I've asked the question, but I want to see if maybe if any of the audience that's here tonight wants to ask a question to the, the family or to myself. Yeah. It looks I like have a question. Katie has um, a Yeah. Hi. Katie's hi. iPad has a question. Hi, Katie. Hi. Hi. Um, I am asking, my question is focused on, you said you had adults in your um, practice or your studies, or um, I, I have a, a, a daughter's in her mid thirties who has LCA. Mm -hmm. um, so she was born in 1985 and um, she's never had genetic testing. It really wasn't, you know, in that time frame, there wasn't anything available. Um, and um, she is nearly totally blind. She has light, you know, perception. She uses a cane and she uses Braille and, and a guide dog. Um, so I'm interested about this. And I don't know if Beth has, my daughter has this gene. Is this a more common one for LCAs or would it, how helpful is it for adults, I guess? Oh, you're talking about to find out what you, what, what specific right. you have. Yeah. Right. Great question. We see a lot of, you know, meaning myself and uh, Dr. Stepien, who, like I said, I probably see at this point in terms of my retinal dystrophy clinic, I probably see about, you know, 80 to 90% children. And then the remainder are adults. Um, and then Dr. Stepien sees probably about 10% children and 90% adults. So um, we see this quite a bit. Cause like you mentioned, um, genetic testing has, is a relatively new phenomenon, you know, um, and even access to it um, is, is relatively new. I think I haven't been here that long, but the seven years I've been here, I've seen it change from being a huge barrier to being relatively easy, easy now, even compared mm -hmm. to when we tested, you know, McKinley. Um, but it's, it's very important for a couple of reasons. I think one is because it helps confirm that the diagnosis is indeed, is indeed labor congenital amaurosis because there's some mm -hmm. scenarios where we think someone is something based on a clinical diagnosis and it turns out they're actually something else, um, a different mm -hmm. retinal condition because sometimes there can be a lot of overlap and misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I think that can help for a couple of reasons. It can help for like prognosis is one and understanding the disease and how it changes um, maybe understanding, you know, the genetics of it and how you may pass it on to your children or, you know, um, those mm -hmm. type of things, but also because there's not only, um, now there's an FDA approved gene therapy for one type of LCA, but there's a lot of other, uh, diseases of the retina, which have current clinical trials and knowing if you potentially could participate in those clinical trials, or if there may be treatment for your condition soon. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's very important. Um, like I said, uh, Dr. Stepan and myself see patients all the time, um, even, you know, older than your daughter that get a diagnosis for the first time. Okay. Um, and I guess the last thing that I forgot to mention is, um, maybe one of the most important things is, um, these diseases may not just affect the eye, they can affect the entire body. So sometimes we're, we're, um, reducing um, the risk of, um, you know, something else happening in the body, um, you know, and I hate to say it, but we have seen patients that have more severe disease that if it hasn't been caught, they may end up um, dying from their disease because of the other way it affects their body. So that's another really important um, reason I think to get tested. 
So she, you would advise for her to be tested? Yes. If she's not interested in gene therapy, because she's, yeah. you know, she doesn't know, yeah. you know, if she want, would want to, we've, we've chatted about this from time to time. She is actually, she was a patient at the UW um, Madison sure. ophthalmology department um, uh, years ago, of course. Um, but so her records, you know, are there, but she, yeah, she has, I think we started the process for some genetic testing at some point, but I think it was cost prohibitive at that time. Um, and we just didn't pursue it. Um, we just didn't know if it would, you know, there wasn't any treatment, I don't think at that time either. So, but, you know, I just yeah. am curious if what I should tell her, you know, or would it be better have adults had this gene therapy and have improved their vision that it improves their, you know, ability to, you know, yeah. get around or. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know if Julie knows more than this, but I know that um, there's been at least, um, in the 30s, if not more patients that, I mean, RP65 is not, to answer one of your questions, is not a very common mm -hmm. um, disease. Um, so talking about the people that have been treated with it so far, I mean, you're talking 30 to 40 patients, you know, I don't know, Julie, okay. if you know an exact number. <laughs> yeah, I don't know an exact number. I just know we, I am a, a, in a Facebook group of um, treated uh, RP65 patients or families of, and there are some adults that have qualified for the surgery. Um, okay. It really all depends on what vision she still has and if it is enough that it would make a difference. So that would mm -hmm. all just, you know, come down to testing, but starting with the diagnosis, I agree with Dr. Schmidt is really important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the question. Yeah. There's another question here. Many of the conditions you mentioned were X-linked. Is this a common trend in ocular diseases? And maybe you should go through what X-linked traits are again too. Yeah, of course. So when I kind of breeze through that, so I'm glad that someone asked more about that. Um, and so when we're talking about X-linked, we're talking about the X chromosomes. And if you, you know, when you identify as a male, typically you have Typically, you have two X chromosomes versus female. You have, or sorry, I meant to have that opposite, but male, you have an X and a Y chromosome, and female, you have two X chromosomes. And um, usually, when we're talking about X linked conditions, we traditionally would say X linked recessive, for example, meaning you needed two defective X chromosomes. Um, or sorry, you needed, um, so it's X linked. So in a female, you would need two defective X chromosomes in order to have the condition. And we always thought that was pretty rare versus males, you just have one X chromosome. And it, even if it's recessive, because you only have one X chromosome, it causes the disease versus you have you know, the other uh, sex chromosome is a Y chromosome. But what we found, you know, more recently, particularly with X linked retinal conditions. Um, and we've known about this process for a long time, but there's inactivation in any given cell of one of your X chromosomes in women. And for example, if you have a larger proportion, if you carry the disease gene on one of your X chromosome and you have a larger proportion of cells in your retina that carry the disease, um, disease gene that are inactivated, you're less likely to have the disease versus if you have a larger portion of uh, normal X, um, um, you know, uh, cells that carry the X chromosome um, um, inactivated, you're more likely to show the disease. So it has to do with um, the percentage of, and this is a little bit complex and I'm probably not explaining it the best, but it has to do with the percentage of X chromosomes that you have inactivated in essentially in your retina um, if you're a woman and whether or not you have the disease. So that's why it's a little bit of a misnomer when we say um, X-linked recessive. And we're leaning towards just causing, calling it X-linked now because we're starting to see as we do more genetic testing, more and more individuals that are female have um, quite severe X-linked disease or moderate. And oftentimes what I see in my male patients that come to me, my uh, young patients that have X-linked conditions, 
I oftentimes question the moms and what happens is the moms usually one of their main symptoms because they're the carriers of the disease though they often aren't diagnosed with it until they come to see me is they stop driving in teenage years or um, 20s at nighttime and that's often overlooked by their physicians or their eye doctors as being oh that's normal you know nobody everyone can't see as well at nighttime um, but oftentimes that you know as we all know you know that isn't normal for most young patients and that is a sign of the disease. And so when we do testing of the carrier mothers, what we find is they have changes maybe more subtle on their, um, in their retina, they have um, changes on their ERG that we are able to detect. And they all, all can have, like I said, moderate to severe disease. But yeah, when talking about, I highlighted some of these excellent conditions um, and, you know, in general, it's not necessarily, um, the more common diseases that we see, um, I would say the most common, um, well, the most common disease gene we see overall is retinitis pigmentosa. Um, and um, uh, the second most common is choroderemia, which is excellent. But retin retinitis pigmentosa, the most common disease that we see um, has not just excellent uh, causes, but it has what we call autosomal recessive, which I mentioned before, also has autosomal dominant causes. And then I misspoke. I said choroderema is the second most common, but actually Stargardt disease is um, the most common, um, second most common disease we, we see. So that's not an X-linked disease. So we see a combination, I would say, of autosomal recessive X-linked and um, autosomal dominant. We just happen to have, I think here at UW-Madison, um, more involvement in some of these X-linked um, clinical trials. I, I just wanted to mention, actually one that's even more common, but we don't treat it per se is color blindness, specifically red green color blindness, which seven to 8% of males in the United States have. Um, that's why some guys just can't put it together in terms of their outfits, if you will. And that's X-linked, meaning that, um, you know, because men only have one X chromosome, if there's a, a hit on that chromosome, their, their Y can't make up for it. Unlike females who have another X chromosome. And if it's normal, then they'll generally have normal color vision. So that's pretty common. Um, can you say something about um, testing siblings, for instance, in a family who may or may not be symptomatic or might be too young to know if, if they've got an older sibling with a disorder? Oh, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Great, great question. This, that's a, um, one of the areas that's a little bit more controversial and it goes into, I think, the, the ethics of genetic testing and genetic counseling. Um, and our genetic counselors that I work with are really great in explaining this, but I'll try to do my best. But um, I think the reason why it's a little bit controversial is, as we know um, in diseases, we know that you may carry um, abnormal changes in your, your, your genes, but you may or may not have the disease. Um, pre, you may not present with it, meaning you may not ever have any symptoms. You may have in some diseases, mild symptoms, you may have severe. So there's a little bit of an ethical debate on whether or not you should test someone before they're, for example, symptomatic. And there's various reasons that can be an ethical debate. Um, because I guess there's the not, there's the not knowing if you test someone and you find out that they have these, these disease gene, genes, you may not ever know that they're going to go on and, and, um, have the disease. That's one part of it. Um, so you're setting this person up and you're giving them a, uh, maybe a diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis when they may not actually go on to ever have a clinical diagnosis. Then you get into, I think also part of the ethical debate is as we do more and more genetic testing, particularly pre-symptomatic, um, are we going to run into issues where um, you may have insurance companies denying patients of care, um, you know, based on this genetic diagnosis, though they don't have any um, symptoms. And then oftentimes when we're looking at siblings, we're looking at children. So there's another part of the ethical debate, which is, are you, are you able to get proper consent from that patient? Um, 
And so obviously that's a whole nother side of the coin. There are certain situations where I find, you know, it's obviously important, but I think a lot of care and a lot of sensitivity needs to be taken when you approach, uh, you know, testing and looking at siblings that may not have symptoms. Um, and so it's a really, I think it's a really personal decision between you and the family and also having the genetic counselor involved to explain from their perspective as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schmidt. This was an absolutely excellent session and uh, we have come to the top of the hour. I am so delighted that everyone uh, chose to join tonight and some wonderful questions as well. Um, just wanted to just say thank you to everybody. Who told for... you that? Okay. <laughs>